So the date is November 1st at 2.26 p.m. My name is Anna Ta. I'm here with Kelly Dong, as well as... Um, Dan Kalongdi. Oh, yes. Um, and we're conducting an interview for the Houston Asian American Archives uh, with the Chow Center at Rice University. Um, could you say your name one more time for the record? Yeah, sure. Danka Wongdi. So when and where were you born? So I was born uh, May 31st, 79, in Copenhagen, Denmark. Okay. Um, could you tell us more about your childhood in Denmark? Yeah, sure. So I, my parents were diplomats. So um, I was born in Denmark, my siblings before in other countries, and we stayed in Denmark probably for about a year after I was born, and then we migrated to um, the Philippines where my dad did his next posting. And how long were you in the Philippines? For about three years. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of either Copenhagen or the Philippines? I do for the Philippines. Um, Copenhagen just, I mean, being, you know, one and a half, no, but around four or five, I have some, you know, striking memories. So just very, very um, humid, like any kind of tropical country. And we were based in Manila, so I just have memories of, you know, being in the backyard and, and things of that nature, but, but nothing mm -hmm. concrete. Yeah. Um, and after the Philippines, um, yeah. you moved? Yeah, after the Philippines, we moved back to India. My parents and family are originally from, from New Delhi. And um, so my dad was stationed. He did a two and a half year assignment back in the home country. Mm -hmm. So we moved back to Delhi. And um, after that, we went to Hong Kong. Hong Kong. So what exactly, um, what exact position did your parents hold? Yeah, sure. So my dad, he served in a... Um, in a government role called the uh, Indian Foreign Service. And if you do the Foreign Service, it basically enables you to be a diplomat, either internally mm -hmm. in the country or externally. So um, my dad started off as secretary, the first secretary, and then he, uh, he, he continued on, and then eventually he, um, he, he was ambassador for India for other countries, and then um, he served in foreign posts back, back in India after he retired. Mm -hmm. Um, just to complete the timeline, after Hong Kong, yes. you moved... We, after Hong Kong, we moved to... My dad moved to Cambodia, or Kampuchea at the time, mm -hmm. uh, Phnom Penh as the capital, and we moved back to India. So we did literally, like, Delhi for two and a half years, we did Hong Kong, and then back to Delhi, and then we moved to London. Mm -hmm. For about... London was for about three years, mm -hmm. and then my, uh, I did my high school in a country called Zambia, mm -hmm. in Lusaka, and then I graduated from from my IB. From where? Uh, the International Baccalaureate. I did the IB and oh. I graduated from Zambia. Oh, okay. Um, so you lived in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, which one did you spend the most time in, or which one do you have the most memories of? Uh, I think the strongest connection um, would probably be Zambia. I think mm -hmm. it's just the the basic growing up, um, and the country is very untouched. It's really beautiful and serene. There's only like nine nine to twelve million population type mm -hmm. size for a country that's quite large. Mm -hmm. So outside of the capital, I mean, you can be driving for miles, you won't see anyone. Mm -hmm. You could see an elephant crossing the road, and that's not even a makeup. We we used to see that occasionally when we were uh, going out of town. Mm -hmm. So I think to me. Yeah, Zambia is where I probably left my heart behind. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you, for your education, how did that work, shifting from place to place? And that's an interesting question. Um, okay, for me, it was tough. And it started getting difficult. In terms of learning, it wasn't difficult, but the adjusting every three years in a new country with new people, it, it's quite traumatic. Um, I would say around middle school, when I was in London, London was a tough post. Like it almost took me a year and a half to make friends and adjust. Um, just because the Indian system was so strict, the British system was almost kind of lenient. So it was kind of a culture shock. But within a year and a half, I, I really fell in love with my friends and the school. And then Zambia was easier. So I think it's the older we get, we know who we are, and it's easier to, to kind of establish your presence. But early on was... It was difficult, but we just didn't know any better. So mm -hmm. we adjusted to what was our norm. Right, yeah. And you had one sibling, is that, or two? I have two, that's right. right. Um, so my sister, 
she actually she was kind of fortunate or not um, the schools that she went to in London was all, uh, an all-girls school it was a little bit protected mm -hmm. and there were other expats in that school so she I felt was more insulated from having to assimilate with the local people mm -hmm. um, she enjoyed also moving around but she really loved doing her her undergraduate she graduated from high school and then studied in London mm -hmm. um, my brother hated pretty much moving around every so he we're all in Houston now and uh, yeah he loves being based here he doesn't want to relocate mm -hmm. he doesn't have that itch yeah yeah <laughs> so I guess she fell sort of in between the two attitudes of yeah. just kind of adjusting but not necessarily really right. loving having to move that's right yeah um, so your parents are from New Delhi uh, no, actually, so they, they reside, or we reside in New Delhi, but they're from a town, my dad's from Darjeeling, and my mom is from a place called Kalingpong, and mm -hmm. they're both smaller towns mm -hmm. in the northeast of India. Okay. So is there a reason why every time you came back to India, you stayed in New Delhi? Yeah. Um, if you're, just like, you know, if you're a government official, you have to be based in D.C. Mm -hmm. And so in India, everything happens in New Delhi for, for government purposes. So it was just because of job. We were always based there, but we would visit like family members, and I think you can imagine it's like the states. Everyone, once they land, just migrates everywhere. So mm -hmm. our cousins had come and moved also to in, to Delhi or to the south of India. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we, we were always based there just because of Dad's job. Mm -hmm. And when he went to Cambodia, or Cam yes, Cambodia. That's here, right? Or Kampuchea before? Yeah. Um, and you guys went to New Delhi. Was there a reason why you didn't follow him back to? Cambodia at the time? Yeah, so at the time there was uh, the Khmer Rouge attacks that were happening oh. and it was uh, like it was pretty unsafe. Um, it was in the Foreign Service, if you do an A posting, meaning a safe Western country, mm -hmm. then you do a C posting, then you do an A posting. Mm -hmm. And some people manage to do C plus postings their whole career. That's what they want. They don't want the merry-go-round. My dad mm -hmm. wanted the merry-go-round. Right. He wanted, sorry, he wanted the roller coaster of a mm -hmm. career. So he took a C minus, which was Cambodia being very dangerous, politically unsettling. Um, yeah, and then we got London after that. So in Cambodia's case, when we arrived to visit my father, and we spent the summers with him, uh, we we had a van of mil of army officials who would carry machine guns with us. Right. So and they would escort us around town. Um, so there were no hotels at the time, there were no schools, all diplomats, I don't even think there were expats, I mean it was either journalists and some foreign officials and they were all pretty much by themselves, their families did not move. Mm. Yeah. How old were you at this time? I was between 8 to 11, mm. you know? so we did the summer vacations or the winter vacations and over mm. there. But, yeah. mm -hmm. What are the times where you would, like, how would you feel um, being escorted in a very dangerous country with men with machine guns? Uh, you know, it's because I think you we don't realize, because even being an expat, like, you assimilate, but you're still in a bubble. I mean, we're fortunate that we had people to look after us, and it was really, really scary, but, you know, like, to me, this it was our norm. We just didn't know any different, so mm -hmm. for us, we would make friends with the military officers and be like, oh, can we... Can we touch your gun or, or take pictures with it? And we just didn't know any mm -hmm. any different. But I know, like for my dad, we had a chance to visit the Angkor Wat, one of the wonders of the world, um, with this group of army officials, and, and we went and we could hear machine gun firing at night, and it was close by, and the hotel would power off electricity like at eight nine mm -hmm. in the night, um, so that they could conserve. The electricity but also that it was safe for the residents so I remember that was the first time I'm thinking yeah it's uh, really really unsafe for my father to be placed here mm -hmm. yeah. yeah were you kept mostly sheltered from the sort of intricacies of his work or would your parents kind of like let you know what exactly it was that he was doing or the dangers that he was possibly facing no so uh, he kept it um, hidden from us. I think just by nature, like I'm sure it's also any government job, the more delicate in nature, the more secretive they have to be. Mm -hmm. And it was never my father's kind of uh, personality to want to share what was taking place. Mm -hmm. But there were indications 
um, like he would have a safe in the office or the office would be locked most days and it was very clear it's not it, it there's a personal life and a private life mm -hmm. and a work life and the work life did not seep into so for me when we did the moving my father was pretty active in our life but Cambodia changed his personality oh really yeah like I could since there's three of us and three children it's rambunctious it's just noisy so when we moved after Cambodia um, to London, I, there, I think there were times I felt he really needed the solitude mm -hmm. to be away from the family and it, I, sometimes I would just catch him kind of daydreaming or reading by himself and it was really with the intent um, I, I cannot be around noise right now mm -hmm. yeah yeah how would you say his personality was before? Uh, he he was a lot more. He's very jovial, and I think he is still jovial. Um, it was Cambodia changed him, and I think it was with the sense of like you see the cruelest of life. Like uh, I'm sure if you've done the like if people have survived the Holocaust, it'll put things in perspective. And Cambodia, I'm not sure if you're aware or not. It's it, they went through Pol Pot's regime and all of this, so. When we went to the Killing Fields, there were no museums at the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you would see bones on the floor, you would see teeth <coughs> in the floor and pieces of garment. And, you know, you're walking as an eight-year-old and my brother's five and my sister is like 11. And there are images of how they used to kill the children. And, again, we, we didn't know any better. We're like, oh my gosh, this is pretty horrific. But I remember we had a, a male um, helper who had migrated with us to Cambodia and he had a newborn back in India. He, he just threw up when he saw the images of how they uh, executed the, the babies. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it's horrific, it's horrific. And I think I will, there's always a shine to living an expat life and it was great, but I will never forget and I will cherish those moments of when you realize you, you have an opportunity to see into a country's history without having to adjust your entire life, and, and I'm thankful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, um, let's see, um, when you were in New Delhi, you were living with your mother and your family? That's yeah. right. Um, and so, your education in New Delhi, how did it compare um, to all the other places, or I guess in general, like how did your education in each place compare? Were you always sure. in international schools? It, it, so in, in in Delhi, we weren't in an international school. We were in a private, like local school. Um, in Hong Kong, international. In London, local, and then Zambia, international. But most of it's been British international. Mm -hmm. um, so in India, it's very. I mean, the, the school system is such, like, you memorize and you study, and, like, I have a little sty right now, it used to be, it used to be strong, but they would make people that at eight years old study three to four hours a day. It was just very normal. Mm -hmm. The kids have to study hard. And because we had gone to Hong Kong, we had to also pass two exams to go to the next grade. Mm -hmm. One being, I think one was English or some, maybe a math class, but one was Hindi. Mm -hmm. And none of us knew Hindi because we had pretty much forgotten it when we moved to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So when we came back, I mean, it was tutors every evening and it wasn't to go ahead in the education. It was to keep up mm -hmm. with the rest of our peers. Um, I think you don't know any better. So to me, I loved it. And I, we stayed in a place where all the diplomats all lived together. It was called um, the External Affairs Hostel. So every day, I remember fondly, we would come from the school bus, my mom would have a hot plate of our favorite food, and she would literally feed us with her hand. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, we're eight years old, it's ridiculous, but she's feeding us with her hand, and after we're done eating, um, we would study, 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 and all the kids finish at exactly the same time every night, and then we would go out and play till honestly 10 or 11 at night. <laughs> and it, it was, like when you think of like the Goonies or that, those type of shows, that's the kind of life we, we grew up with. So it was really, like it was really beautiful. That was, that was a fun time. But um, in terms of education, so doing India, it was strong. Then we moved to Hong Kong. Hong Kong was an international school, it was easy to keep up. But London, 
the whole system, like we had design technology where you had to do home cooking, you had to actually build like you know electronic circuit boards and things of that nature, and we weren't doing that in India. Mm -hmm. like at the time in Delhi, for us, it was just memorize, 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 history, math, and like the STEM classes, which you would say. So I think for education, it was a big culture shock. Like uh, in India, for example, if the teacher calls your name, you have to put up your hand, say yes sir or madam, and you have to stand up. Mm -hmm. So the first day I did that in London, oh my god, they just tore into me. It was it was pretty brutal. <laughs> it was really brutal. Because they, yeah, in London you address your teacher, probably like here by the first name. And um, it was uh, just really funny. Um, the other thing is, the school that I went to, it wasn't probably the strongest or the best schools at all. So I was probably like the only Asian kid in that school. I feel this is the story of my life. I'm mostly the only Asian kid in school. Um, and the, it was like severe bullying. Like they would wait for the teachers after school and a certain group would just beat up the teachers, man. Yeah, <laughs> that's like, I know, I know, it was crazy. So it was a year and a half of trying to survive that nonsense and, and then assimilating. A and I will tell you this, as a parent, you don't, like I have a four-year-old, I don't ever want him to go through that, but if you can survive that, it'll really make you strong. Like, yeah, it's easy to go to college and, and then, and then uh, manage. So there was, okay, there was London, and then Zambia was an international school. So if, yeah, not too, not too different, but um, yeah, Zambia, I'd say, is where I developed my interest for what I wanted to study. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the culture shocks moving from um, so Copenhagen to the Philippines to India to Hong Kong back to India slash Cambodia during the summers and then to London and Zambia? Sure, sure. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Even I have to keep it straight. Right. Um, I think like the culture shock, part of it is growing up and realizing you're going to be a teenager and then in middle school and all the heartaches of just growing up, right? right? And, and then part of it is different culture and then realizing you're a minority in a minority group. And like even, so I'm Tibetan by background. So I'm a minority in India out of 1.2 billion. Our small little Tibetan community is a small minority group. Then you go to somewhere like Zambia where there are no Asians, <laughs> or, or I would say people from Southeast Asia. Um, so again, it's really quite shocking. And then in London, um, the the predominant groups were yeah British, white or, um, or or black from from their country. So to me, the culture shock was part of growing up, but it was also just um, trying to realize who I was at the time I was in, and also assimilating fast. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you talk to, I'm sure parents tell you, like, individuality matters and stuff, but when you're trying to survive in middle school and above, it's like survival mode. So you don't want to stick out, you just want to assimilate mm -hmm. and, and move on. And for me, the culture shock was how fast can you assimilate in every country? Mm -hmm. Like, for six months, you got to assimilate, you got to make friends, and you just... That, that'll that protect you for the next three years. Mm -hmm. So, there was that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would, um, I suppose like the food and the, the clothes, would they change at each location as well, like the customs? You know, it's really interesting. So, like if you look as a demography right now, what, maybe if you and Kelly might be like an age group of 20 to 25, right? Or some, some, some somewhere around there. What, the millennials wear today around the world is pretty much the same. Like the interests are all the same. And you can look through social media and find out it's kind of the same things. And it, it wasn't different in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So when I went to London, like this, the fashion changed. But the, when I moved to Zambia, they wanted the British designers and they all wanted the cool cars. And it's they all knew about the same pop stars and rock stars, whatever it was. So. That's something of a shock to me. When you're the same, when you're young, mm. it kind of normalizes. Like it, the same things that are popular are popular everywhere in the world. Right. And uh, 
that that to me was a shock. So coming from London, I found it easier to assimilate to to Zambia because they wanted to know about the trends, the the music and everything. And since my sister was still based in London, I had a I had a real feed into getting all of that without having to to try too hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, that is interesting. So, um, you were saying that in Zambia, it's where you left your heart, yeah. so to speak. Could you talk more about your time there? Sure. Um, so, in Zambia, like I think, I felt after leaving London, I had this power of, I survived middle school stroke entering into high school, and I did not know who I was. I thought I did, but I, I really didn't. And in Zambia, when we when we landed into Lusaka, there were race riots within the first week of us landing, and they were race riots against Indians. So I remember going to our house, and there were Indians, I mean, crowded around our embassy because the embassy, as you might know, is your country, is your nation's protection border. So. Mm -hmm. Um, many of them are Zambians saying we're Indian national background can we can we seek refuge and my dad couldn't you have to be Indian um, and where was I going with this I was going with this in Zambia the the disparity between the have and the have-nots was incredibly apparent that is the first realization of race disparity I really came across and by that, what do I mean? I mean, so we had an international school, and maybe 2% of that are expats, internationals, whatever you want to call us, but they ran the school. Even though there were wealthy Zambians in the school, you could feel the inequality, so to speak. And um, even though, I almost feel like it was an African Beverly Hills 9 or 2 and 0, that, that is what it was trying to emulate. Like who had the best cars, who had the best vacations, and it, it was, it was, that was a little bubble that we had. And I found a group of friends who just didn't care any, about any of that nonsense. Um, we just had our own little world and we were pretty happy. So it, that was, that was the one aspect I really loved. I got to know the culture and the people and the local dialects and in IB you have to volunteer. You just have to, right, to, to graduate. So we did it in, in a foundation house, Mother Teresa's AIDS Foundation House. Um, and I would say at 16 if you're coming into contact with AIDS patients, it'll, it'll change your mind about, about how lucky you are in life. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think it was just this whole like mind-blowing realization of, of the world and that happened in Zambia and then um, I also fell in love like hard for the first time in Zambia so of course that's going to be soul crushing good and bad mm -hmm. but uh, yeah that was in Lusaka. Um, just to return to the race riots you were saying against against Indians, yeah. where obviously it's hard to pinpoint exactly the causes of, of such things other than just blatantly racism but um, I guess what was the sort of political climate climate at the time about about this? Oh yeah, for sure. So, uh, okay, post-colonial era, um, of course, the African countries started breaking, and Southern Africa was different than many of the others, where there were no there were the race riots were terrible, but it was not like a blood, mm. you know, massacre that happened in in certain other areas. And what wound up happening, the power shifted of course to either white farmers or Indian business people and they started treating the local black African nationals with such disdain that there was an uprising and when we came to Zambia it was it was around 94 1994 so a lot of the local banks were held privately by Indian or South Asian um, business people they wound up stealing the money and shifting a lot of poor people's entire life savings to Europe, to the Cayman Islands, to Swiss bank accounts. They filed bankruptcy and overnight they were gone. And so what the race riots were is a history of colonial era of 
of complete poverty and knowing that they're not going to get out. And there, at the time, there was also stories that Indians were were doing tests on local black children for for um, religious purposes. And whether it was true or not, it really came out, and that's that's what wound up happening. So. We were Zamb okay, so Zambia's here, South Africa's here, and then there was apartheid, and then the, the end of apartheid, and we were there when apartheid ended in South Africa, and it it spilled onto Zimbabwe and Zambia very strongly. So, yeah, within four years of us being there, local black African nationals knew that they don't have to have this colonial mindset that they need to be still run mm -hmm. by the colonizer. Right. You know, even post independence. Mm -hmm. So, how did your father, as the Indian uh, diplomat, in a place where there's currently like a backlash yeah. of against against uh, Indian nationals, how did he have to sort of deal with this? How did it kind of spill into your own life? Yeah, in your first year of adjusting. I know for him, he went head to toe with a lot of the private banks. So, friends who were friends of mine, and we're we're silly. We're 16 years old. We don't know any better, but. Overnight, they had to leave, and their families packed their bags and, and were in, in the UK. And stories came out about um, him basically trying to go to toe to toe. And one thing I will say about my dad, I have always felt his moral compass is clean. So I'll, he was very clear: it's not because you are South Asian background there will be protection. <laughs> and he he at the time sided with some of the African leaders. But stuff over there imploded that I'm sure he, maybe, he, yeah, it's a different account of how he sees things. But to me, I remember feeling like some of my friends probably were blaming the ministry and other diplomats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if you want to, we can also circle back to, I know you mentioned that, like, in Zambia, um, like social relationships and stuff like that too, and also um, you said that you, it was a place where you first fell in love for the first time. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> it feels like it, <laughs> ages ago, but yeah. Right. Um, so that's not your current husband, right? No. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So how did you meet your your current husband? How did I meet him? Um, we were were based in Houston, and I was working at a company called Slumbershay um, previously, so it was through mutual friends that we met, and um, we met at a place actually in Rice Military, just down the road, which wasn't popular back then mm -hmm. at all. So yeah, it was it was actually very fast. We inter got introduced, and within six months we got engaged. So oh, wow. yeah, it was it was kind of nuts, <laughs> but it's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was it that you said, what company did you work for? It was a company called Slumberger. Okay. Um, oh wait, sorry, just to backtrack a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, you also mentioned that in Zambia, that's where you found out what you're interested in studying. What yes. exactly yeah. is that? Um, so, in Zambia, I was very interested in history, political science, and I think if life had maybe gone a different way, um, I wanted to be a journalist. Like, yeah, really, I mean, work for CNN at the time or go through a journalist program um, was uh, was of interest. And at the time, like, my parents are in the government service, so um, tuition and school is ridiculous. I guess things haven't changed that much, but it was ridiculously pricey, and there were three of us. So I applied to scholarships um, at schools, and I got into some, some good ones, but at the time, Three going through university at the same time, I kind of made the decision to go with a, uh, with a subject that would be like a, just a guarantee getting mm -hmm. a job. So I I kept those interests still there, but then I moved over to finance where mm -hmm. I specialized um, through my undergrad. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you did for Slumberjay? Yeah, I did accounting finance and um, my first internship ever was Enron. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a summer analyst or an analyst for one year for um, in 2001, and then and then I moved over to Slumberjay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, how old were you when you were get had the summer internship? I was I was like a sophomore, so I was 20. 
Yeah. And then you graduated from what university? Uh, University of Houston. Oh, okay. So you went to Schlumberger where you were... What exactly? Uh, I worked as an accounting supervisor and then an accounting manager and then uh, I moved over to a company at, uh, in Houston called FMC Technologies. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that um, your current uh, work? No. So um, it, it gets in the scheme of it. I did like a FMC for about 10 years and then I moved recently over to a company called General Electric for right. the energy connections division. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you find that it sort of brings in your interest in the politics and the history? Yeah. I think, you know, back, I mean, I'd say really graduate, even the culture shift with corporations, in our generation coming from school, you have to understand, like, it was prestigious to get into a, a company and work for the man mm-hmm. and, and do all of that. So nowadays, like, for the new generation, it's... Like, the sky's the limit. You don't need to go to school to have a job. Like, it's a huge disparity. And for me, the interest, I I did a big shift from accounting, moving to, like, marketing, mm-hmm. which is more creative. And mm-hmm. it, happened in, it, it happened towards the end of my career in FMC. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I find, especially in GE, where 80% of the revenue of the company is from overseas, mm-hmm. it's been... It's been very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, you also indicated on your consent form that you have a master's. What yeah. in? Oh, so it's in international finance. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you got that from U of H as well? No, it was from University of St. Thomas. Oh, St. Thomas. Um, and um, what made you decide to, to get it? Um, so I wondered... I wanted to better myself and go to the next level of education and I was actually debating between like doing um, a master's in English or something like that or or still with my interest and I maybe I've been a little bit lazy when I think about it but finance came easy to me and math and that stuff actually came easy so the international aspect which which is my interest marrying it with the finance which came easy I felt like it's a good fit Mm -hmm. and um, at the time at FMC uh, basically to get promoted and stuff they were like you have to go for your masters and I was like yeah I'm not gonna pay for it (laughs) so then they they also just paid for my education which was good okay Um, also uh, how do you spell Slumberjay? Slumberjay S-C-H-L U-M-B-E-R-G-E-R okay Let's see. Um, you initially moved to Ohio when you came to the United States, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, where exactly in Ohio? So I was in a town called Worcester, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, so in Zambia, when I was doing the entrance exams for all the schools and stuff, uh, liberal arts colleges at the time, and I think they still do it, they target worldwide international schools mm-hmm. and they give about a stipend of 50 to 75 percent on scholarship and merit wow. so when i wrote the entrance exam for worcester it was like a five-hour scholarship program whatever and then i when i got in i talked to my my advisor at the time in in lusaka in zambia and she said i think it's better that you go to a small town versus an overwhelmingly big city in the u.s and she was wrong. She was just <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> so I did one year of that, and I, yeah, I was like, I need to go to a big, a big city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what was the name of that liberal arts school? Yeah, it's called the College of Worcester. Oh, okay. Um, and so you decided, how did you decide on U of H? Um, so my parents, they were at the time still in Zambia, and I came, I was the first one to come to the States. Mm-hmm. And then my, my, my mom and dad got posted to, Zamb- uh, to Houston, mm-hmm. um, as uh, my dad was a consul general, and then I came over a year later. Mm-hmm. Um, just in terms of expense, yeah, it, it really, I felt I was burdening my parents. Mm-hmm. It was just too much all happening at the same time. <coughs> so I wanted to also come and live with them and my ma- my mom was also having health issues mm-hmm. that I wanted to be closer to her so it, it just it just fit mm-hmm. yeah yeah um, so what is your what do your parents currently do so actually my dad is retired 
Um, he sits, I think, on a, um, as a board member for like a chemical company, uh, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So he might uh, go to like um, one meeting every three to four months, but it's mm -hmm. it's not uh, too difficult. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, my mom is happy back in Delhi with her with her siblings. So uh, yeah, they come to visit once a year. Oh, okay. Um, and is your dad still here in Houston? No, he is. Uh, he's in um, in India. Now. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, do you visit them much? Do you do much traveling now, or? Yeah, or? I know. Actually, we do. Like with my little guy, we still try to visit my fam, my husband's family in France, and then my parents in India. So mm -hmm. we'll 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 see them once a year as well. Yeah. Um. So, if you don't mind us going back again, sure, a little bit. Um. Uh. So your parents. Um, met a lot of really important people, I'm sure, during yeah. their work, including Mother Teresa. How did that happen? Um, I mean, it was, you know, it, it's not even hosting. Being a diplomat, you are basically being a good, you are being the best representation of your country overseas. So whether that means exchanging or improving culturally or business-wise or economically for your country, it is trying to marry the two countries. Mm -hmm. The one that you represent and then the, the country that you're in. Mm -hmm. And I found dad to be charismatic. Like he was an actor. When I saw my father go overseas, he was an actor. So he really chased after trying to make relationships. Mm -hmm. And then when he finished work, he was it was on his downtime. Mm -hmm. And like with Mother Teresa and stuff, it, it, I felt it happened organically that he wanted to have the same types of homes that were in Calcutta mm -hmm. in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So she was trying to establish charitable homes all throughout. Mm -hmm. And having the Indian ambassador represented um, in Cambodia was the big plus. So right. yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's what wound up happening with either business people. And it's funny because I know in life, it depends on who you're impressed by. Mm -hmm. My parents were never impressed. Well, I'll say who they were impressed by. <laughs> they they often congregated towards people of educated um, backgrounds or mm -hmm. people who who were survivors from war torn type um, events. And they, I remember f having like writers and authors as well at our house. Mm -hmm. And so that's. That's what I remember, yeah, at my, did, my, my dad's parties. Mm -hmm. Did um, Growing up as a diplomat's kid, did you have to go to a lot of the sort of formal events? Oh yeah, oh my god, <laughs> that's crazy. I don't remember a weekend that my parents were at home. Mm -hmm. and it was okay, because we don't know any different. So mm -hmm. we had our sitter or our nanny at the time, the three kids, and then as we got older, it was you just have to, you really have to represent. And in some cases, if they're doing something they would make us have to represent the um, the consul or the high commission. Like mm -hmm. I remember in, in England at the time, it was my first job ever. Um, there was a big like children's program or something, and we were representing the India House, and uh, it was Princess Diana, of course, and all the royals. So mm -hmm. having the opportunity to meet Diana before she passed was, I think, it was kind of. Right. It's like, it's legendary, so. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Do you remember meeting her very well? I do. Um, I remember meeting her, and what you see, of course, her being shy, she was very, like, she she really hated the spotlight, but when she was around the little children and she was shaking hands, she was hugging everyone, and it was that was kind of shocking. And before that, um, or around that time, my first job was in a place called Harrods, and Harrods is like, I guess, like the Barneys or Sachs of, of London. Mm -hmm. So within the first week, I remember um, Prince William and Harry going through with their bodyguards. And, uh, it, you know, it was kind of crazy because there's like 13-year-olds and I'm a 14-year-old um, working there. But th I think those opportunities I wouldn't have had if, yeah, my parents mm -hmm. had been had traveled and, and, and uh, so yeah. it was fun. Yeah. Um. Were, was there a lot of pressure to act a certain way whenever you were kind of performing like diplomat kid duties? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's uh, 
I mean, I think we understand the the filter, and it's just being courteous. But mm -hmm. I would say to be a diplomat's child, you have to be politically aware. It's almost the basis. You have to be able to hold your own ground because if they seat you at a table, mm -hmm. you do have to know how to carry a conversation with any and everyone, even if the person doesn't speak a word of English. Right. Um, you have to find out a way. So. There's a lot of expectations, but I will also say, like, my brother chose to completely not live by any of that, mm -hmm. and he did not attend any of the functions, and my sister and I, mm -hmm. we just enjoyed it, so we were okay with it. Yeah. And did your parents kind of not mind that your brother didn't, what, had no interest? I think they, pref they were almost with the mindset, at least there's three of us, if two represent, mm -hmm. it's better that he doesn't make a commotion mm -hmm. or a problem than not being there so the joke is when we when those same friends see my parents they're like we didn't even know you had a son <laughs> for four years we just never saw him so yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay um you also mentioned earlier that you have tibetan ancestry but yeah. that your parents are obviously from india yeah. um so were they immigrants or were their families just back no i th from what I understand, it was almost three to four generations. Oh, wow. um, and uh, yeah, because at the time, of course, there were no borders. So people did migrate from the Northeast very easily through China, mm -hmm. Tibet, and then to India. And there's a large Tibetan Nepalese community, of course, in, in India. So mm -hmm. um, I would say, but maybe it's similar to, to Americans. You feel Indian first, but it's what is your heritage, and, you, and then you feel very close ties to being Tibetan. Right, yeah. Um, so, were you raised with any s specific sort of Tibetan uh, customs? Yeah, um, so it's it's little things like for New Year's, uh, like we have a, a New Year's on the lunar calendar, so it's very similar to Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much sometimes the same day and it's called Loser. So we always visit the temple, we go for celebration, and even on the Western New Year's on January 1st, we always go to temple. Um, we, my parents were never practicing with us. It's, they were very spiritual though, so we went to the five um, cities that are very important for Buddhists, like where Lord Buddha got his um, enlightenment and, and so where he was born and then finally where he passed. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of um, visiting of temples and and uh, monasteries as well. Hmm. Was there? I don't know the um, political climate towards Tibetans, but was there ever any like discrimination? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, not against necessarily Tibetans because Tibetans, if you if you might um, understand, we're we. Uh, it's a peaceful group, and it's small. Um, it's a small number and because Hinduism being 90% of the population of India and Buddhism are so closely tied there was never any issue with Tibetans per se but because we look different and there were attacks in the 60s by the Chinese to India so if anyone looked Southeast Asian backgrounds I mean I, my mom told me that they would have signs on their cars if people hordes of people were coming to try to attack or break into the windshields you know we are indian we're not chinese oh, uh, wow. yeah and like india it's interesting because everyone i think i feel it's a good melting pot of living in harmony and they're very clear like affirmative action is set in stone in india so for the college systems it's called either tribes people from from tribal backgrounds or castes mm -hmm. have a solid quota mm -hmm. that uh, it's just guaranteed oh, right. and uh, yeah it's I, I do think it's important and they, they've pushed that even more so with the government today mm -hmm. um, do you think that um, these sort of negative feelings towards like Chinese or anyone who looks yeah. um, East Asian do you think that these um, attitudes still exist today I think so. If I talk to my parents, they will say no. Mm -hmm. But if you ask our generation, like I, but I, you know, I think, uh, you must understand, like growing up now, we, there's a lot more demand for your right. 
mm. and what is your right in the first place than, 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 than ever existed before. Mm. So I think the youth of today are demanding their right stronger than has ha ever taken place. Right. So like when you hear of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and of course Buddhism and, and spirituality being peaceful, it's very important but the younger generation are impatient and they're saying if it's not going to be given to us we'll find a way to take it. And mm -hmm. so I think with that discourse happening in India, with with all the feminist, you know, pro woman push that has taken place from a top down government approach <laughs> and from the people, like the country is just it's so exciting to see where mm -hmm. this one point two billion people are gonna go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um yeah. Did you, in your childhood, have to face any sort of discrimination? Um, oh my god. <laughs> it was all the time, right? Really? Yeah. Um, sorry, what was your, do you want to um, finish the question before I jump in? <laughs> no, um, I guess in each of the places, I mean obviously it's a different sort of social background and sure. a different environment, but how did discrimination play in at, at each place? Sure. So probably the one place I didn't feel it was Hong Kong, um, <laughs> but uh, I would say in, in, in Delhi, I was still young and I mean, you know, if they're saying hateful words, they would say it. Um, my, I will give my mom the credit. She really told us they do not get away with it. So the moment they say it, you have to do something about it. And she always demonstrated to do something about it. So we were pretty quick to do it. I think the shock to me was London. Because you're like, okay, I don't understand. You're a minority. If you're um, black British and you're discriminating against Indians or other races, it's it's strange. And I mean, I was... I think it's one, kids being cruel. They'll be cruel worldwide at any age. They'll find a reason to... And if they can't find something, then they'll pick on race. And so in London for the first year, when I say it was difficult, it was difficult because I was Asian. Right. Yeah, it, for sure. And um, it was antagonistic. One, big being an outsider, and then two, looking different. And you realize how to get around that pretty fast. Um, in Zambia, being a minority, I think, really, it was, oh, you don't speak Chinese. But I, I, I will tell you, Anna, to me, the biggest shock is in a multicultural city like Houston or the States, feeling it. Mm -hmm. And in present day, that's the type of stuff. Like, I think maybe, it must have been three years ago, I was in my office and some, some officer of the company was walking around and he was like, oh, I need someone who speaks Chinese. Do you speak Chinese? And I'm like, no, because I'm not Chinese. And he's like, why don't you speak Chinese? And I was like, don't, why don't you speak Chinese? <laughs> A billion people speak it. I mean, yeah, and uh, I think people, yeah, it's just all those types of situations I can think of. And it's happened in New York. It's happened in Chicago. It is not small town, mm. you know, what, what you would think. So when I came to the U.S., and this is any immigrant worldwide, you think of U.S. and you think of New York, the Statue of Liberty, the Golden Gate Bridge, mm -hmm. think of super big cities, and you don't realize this middle America and this disparity of big cities versus rural living. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest culture shock ever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what would the kids in London say or do exactly? Yeah, so I mean they would they would tease about the eyes. Can you see properly? Yeah, this is a fun one. And they would say, you know, chink, gook, all of those types of words would always um, come out. It was, why is your skin so yellow? Are you not getting... Yeah, and so it's those type of hateful things were always said, but it was when you when I think back, it's almost a test to see how much can you take before you break and I have a mixed race child and you know the situation in the world today especially in the states like between um, talking about privileged societies and privileged cultures right now you don't have to look too far to see that it's it's happening still of course very strong today and I tell my husband who thinks I'm dreaming all of this up in my head uh, and he's like it doesn't exist in Houston I'm like you won't know it because you're not Asian but you will experience it when your child experiences it and he will experience it and you have to be ready when he experiences that because yeah yeah <laughs> so it's it's interesting yeah um, it's interesting that's it <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, let's see. So, your husband is white. Yes. Uh -huh. So your your child is is four. Right? He's four. That's right. Okay. okay. Um, have you has he have you had to deal with anything as a parent regarding like any kind of discrimination towards um, your child yet or? No, he will, you know, it's funny, it's not, it's not even about discrimination, it's maybe about stereotypes just in general. Mm -hmm. Like he will say, oh, I want to be friends with this girl, but she doesn't have blonde hair, so, you know, she, she's not like my, she's not like a Barbie, she's, mm -hmm. she's, she's not worth knowing. And mm -hmm. I can see that the kids, I don't know if they're bringing it from the homes, I think they're bringing it from the homes. Because mm -hmm. they will say things that are as... It's just upsetting. Our next door neighbor plays with our son all the time. And she also said, you know, I can't, can I marry a black boy? And she's five. And I'm like, the fact that you're questioning, can you, as it is, no one should be marrying anyone or talking about marriage at four or five years old, it's, it's shocking. But the fact that you think you have to ask for this race versus mm -hmm. any other race is what shocks me. And the mom, of course, is embarrassed and stuff, but I'm like, you understand, we send them to schools where you don't see those people. So they don't know any different because the standard, when we were growing up in Disney films and schools, is everyone looks one way. So they're gonna think that, because we all, we all, everyone is, is one certain class. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, how has your experience in Houston um, been different uh, or compared to every other place you've lived in? Sure. Um, so Houston, I think it's, you know, like I was just driving here and it's been the longest I've ever stayed in a place. I feel it's a diverse city with pockets of diversity showcased. And you get like a Hurricane Harvey or right now with the Astros and the Dodgers and the World Series, that the city comes together, but it takes a catastrophic event for the city to come together. And that is how I felt. I think we acknowledge each other's existence without really understanding each other's existence as a city, mm -hmm. or maybe as a community. Um, I do think this next generation of like your age and younger are gonna change that drastically. And it's, I think it's a good time to be alive right now. Like it's, I look at my son and I know there's other issues going on, but I'm like, it's a great time to be young and mm -hmm. to be alive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Could you expand on that a little bit more? Um, yeah, sure. It's, I think, you know, it's just like, so you saw Harvey and then I'm sure, were you guys around for Katrina, but like, so we've seen a lot of natural disasters and Harvey, the way our city, there's many reasons, but I, I'm a big believer, <coughs> Harvey at the essence did not have too many casualties because of social media as well. Mm -hmm. And this connectivity of people and assets and the internet of things and all of that, but this connectivity of people worldwide has never been so prominent as it is now. And I think a child growing up like in rural Madagascar has the same opportunity to get into a program or not as a person in upstate New York and even if they don't get into schools that previously was a pyramid scheme of what happens in life you have people who are able to make livelihoods from social media from from platforms that didn't exist before so when I say to my son like the school won't define you people around you won't define you if you want to be a pink princess today which he wants to be a pink princess today I'm like, that's cool because society today is accepting in a way that just didn't happen before. Mm -hmm. even, even five years ago, it wasn't accepting. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon. People don't know what to do right now. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it's a great time to be alive, yeah, and, and young. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. How have you sort of brought in, I guess because your background is such um, a sort of quilt of different cultures uh, because you've lived in so many places and you're of course the daughter of diplomats, but how do you sort of bring in those 
ties to your culture uh, now in your daily life and sure. also in raising of your son? It's it's funny because you know you don't realize your culture I think until you have a child. You can be you can have it with your parents and everything, but um, it. It's funny, my husband will do it through language, so Kenzo knows French. Mm -hmm. I'm not so adamant about knowing Hindi, which, which I do know, but I want him to understand the roots of what has made his background from being Tibetan Indian to now. So in terms of food, in terms of even books, like we do the readings of like um, the Bhagavad Gita or the, the, the famous books for, for India, just about all the princes and princesses and the, the kings and, and um, gods that have existed throughout time. So to him, they're kind of like cool Star Wars characters, but he doesn't realize he's learn, learning about Lord Krishna or, or whatever it is. And I also want him to open books that there's a blue baby and a brown baby and you know, it, it's it's different. So I'm trying to incorporate that into our life. And I would also say food for us, like Indians love to eat. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge part of what I want him to grow up with is knowing the different types of cuisines. So like we've tried to introduce him to sushi, to to Indian food, to Thai food, stuff like that. So mm. at least, yeah. yeah. We do our, I think in our mind, what is our part? But um, mm -hmm. at the end, he's also American. So that's right. that's important. Yeah. Um, and uh, how do you sort of tie it into your daily life? Um, you mentioned earlier that you still go to temple, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So when we wake up with Kenzo, what I try to do, maybe I'm also being a little lazy, but the moment I wake up, I'll say, let's meditate and make sure that we can count up to 20 and doing a breathing exercise. And that is how we start the day. So I tell him that is, I want you to be able to calm yourself, that you're not in a panic the moment you open your eyes. So we'll try the one, two, three, and then breathe in and out. And I find it settles him better, so he's ready to go to school. Mm -hmm. um, from a day-to-day -day life, we'll talk about our backgrounds quite a bit, but I also want him to know <coughs> he's not quite unusual like the other kids. Like, for example, I send him to just a Montessori program, but I'll send him, you know, Indian food. and. It can look interesting. I will put it this way. It's probably not meatloaf for a sandwich. And so he asked me the other day, can I just have a sandwich? And I was like, no, you'll eat the food I'm giving you because it's probably healthier. And once he goes to college, once he goes to high school, I know the cafeteria will be a certain way. So I'm trying to incorporate just making sure he likes foods that we've grown up with as well. Yeah. I sound so crazy. I feel like I sound really crazy about that. But no, the food is it makes important. Sense. Yeah, <laughs> no, of course. Um, you also mentioned earlier that like your mom would, would cook you your favorite foods and like feed you by hand too, yeah. right? What exactly is your, your your favorite food? Is it Indian or Tibetan or no? Both? You know, it's uh, it, it's continued to evolve, but at the time, I just I mean, it's just local home food. Like it's lentils and rice and some yummy curry and like papadums and stuff mm. like that. So I remember coming home famished and then the three plates and, and her just, it was so much love, we didn't know what to do with all that mm -hmm. affection. So, yeah, yeah that, was, that was fun. Are your parents, um, I know that they live in India, but are they very involved as well in, in raising your um, son and also in your daily life? You know, I think, and I will say this wisely, my mom, so, in my in-laws' case, they have taken a very active role in my child and the grandkids. I would say my parents have deliberately chosen not to take an active role, not for lack of interest. My mom said it six months ago, you guys are the adults now and you need to find your way with your family. Mm -hmm. It is not for us to navigate. and. I respected that she actually said, like, you guys run the house, now you need mm -hmm. to, but if you need help, we'll always be there. Right. So they're active in the sense they will send over information, they will ask to see, we will do FaceTime, but are they trying to pivot us to where our life should be? No. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes me sad to have my fa my parents overseas when all three children are in the same city. Mm -hmm. And we have often debated if they were to relocate, mm -hmm. it's not difficult to come here and mm -hmm. settle here immediately. One being ex-diplomats, you get 
you get citizenship pretty fast, mm -hmm. but they have zero interest. Mm -hmm. And I would say number one is my dad is very proud to be Indian. I mm -hmm. think it would kill him to give up his passport. Right. That is my personal opinion. And then number two is I think my mom has felt, because she had interesting in-laws, but she has felt to be too close to the kids will finish them. Mm. in the long term. It will it will be detrimental to the marriage, it will be detrimental to the kids and the growing up. So mm -hmm. I I am appreciative of what they've done, but I miss them every day. Mm. Of course. Um did you ever have any problems um immigrating to the States? I know that that's a big like current topic of conversation sure, sure. is how difficult oh should God. it be for immigrants to, to get visas and green cards and citizenship. Sure. But I suppose as a as a daughter of, of um, diplomats, was it difficult for you at all sure. uh, in immigrating here? Uh, we will we'll go long into this story. So in the 80s, up until about the late 80s, it was fairly easy. What is classified was easy. Um, if you got into your undergrad, you get a job within six months, you get your green card. Within one year, you get your citizenship. Mm -hmm. And at the time for me, coming overseas and I had a diplomatic passport, you're right, no problem. Then 9 11 happened. Right. And 9 11 was the shift. I'm just, I don't think people will understand. 9 11 was the shift about how coming into the country changed everything. And um, for us, it wasn't too difficult, but we are, when my parents retired, you get your Indian passport. And having an Indian passport does take longer than a European passport. So for us, I think it took maybe seven or eight years, which is pretty long. Um, and now it has become basically impossible. It is just impossible. Mm -hmm. um, unless you come at a senior executive level into the country. I would say even through education now. Come at the time in Houston, Enron, all the energy companies did visas without question. They just closed their eyes and did everyone did it. And mm -hmm. now you look and it's just one after the other will not do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they don't want to do it. They want to. They're not willing to go up. Because what winds up happening is the quotas got smaller. So in our year, and I might be off, so please forgive me, but it's just a ratio to understand. In 2001, it was like 250,000 open visas. Now it's like 80 and then it went to 40. So you're competing. Even if your company says, I'll sponsor you, you're competing with so many people. Mm -hmm. My husband's company, for example, they sponsor um, two interns every year. The interns are quite often denied. Really? Yeah, even though they're willing to do the paperwork, they've paid the legal fees, they're, they're denied because they're fighting with one out of what, maybe 100 people mm -hmm. for one spot. Right. right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it would still... If your if your parents would decide to come over, yeah. because they were senior executives, they would be able to. I think I mean yeah, it, through uh, green card, through dependent, um, and then I know with the diplomatic uh, passport, at, when he retired, the offer was there to come back, and uh, yeah, I, I respect him, but he said no. <laughs> thank you, but no, thank you. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that you were involved with the, um, I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's the Indo Chamber yeah. of Commerce. Yeah. Could you um, tell us a little bit about your involvement there? Sure. Um, so the chamber started in 2002. I think it actually started with my dad and some of his friends for the Indian community. And what they have tried to do in the beginning was small business um, expansion of Southeast Asian and South Asian people in town mm -hmm. and it's kind of taken a form of itself that the chamber has now become liaised with kind of the political parties in town and they also do showcasing of like female leaders who are minorities or you know um, South Asian leaders in kind of the oil and gas or industrial sector so um, it's been I, I work at GE, so working with the Indo Chamber has been a perfect uh, opportunity to bring in guest speakers from both sides. So mm -hmm. we'll represent, we'll show some representation from GE to the Chamber to have events, and then they will in turn be able to maybe get us, like the mayor, to come to our campus and, and give a talk, mm -hmm. which has been incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and with your job at GE, what exactly are your sort of responsibilities? Or sure. So right now I'm doing product marketing for a business called Automation and Controls. Um, we make control unit units for basically all industrial type assets like turbo machines, uh, for airplanes, for oil and gas equipment. Mm -hmm. And um, like 10 years ago, you were selling stuff that was hardware and now like everyone's moved to software services as a sale, so mm -hmm. that's it's a whole business model change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, are there other parts of your experience in your life, or maybe even just your parents' experience, that we haven't had the ability to touch on yet? No, I, I mean, you know, it's. I think the questions that you're asking have been incredible, because it's, I've not asked myself that. I would say if just like any person's perspective, it's unique. So mine is different from than what my sister went through to what my brother did. But um, I think f first generation immigrants are interesting because uh, you don't feel like you belong in the one country. I'm 20 years here. You don't really feel like you belong here, but you will never feel like you belong there. And that is, I think, what makes America also pretty neat because there's mm -hmm. so many. There's mm -hmm. just so many of us. And then you get the generations through. And I think. I want to touch on it. It's really like the evolution of the culture right now. You can smell it, you can feel it, you can see it. And um, I think, you know, back in the day, you had to go to college and blah, blah, blah. It was this fixed thing. I think for my parents' generation to comprehend that we would do something of interest and actually get paid for what we love is shocking. And then I think as we get older, we will not understand what motivates individuals like you, Kelly, or even my son mm -hmm. in 20 years. So I think it's just every decade you see a mind shift of people and how the country's going to move. And I, 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 that's that's what I wanted to share. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of my parents for showing us mm -hmm. this opportunity and giving us this opportunity and uh, hopefully we, we make something of ourselves for our kids as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, do you, have you found that there's a community of other first generation immigrants or like um, Indians or Tibetans here in Houston that you've been able to connect with? Yeah, I, I it's interesting because so through the chamber or through my parents we still have strong ties in the neighborhoods we grew in, yes, but I would say most of my friends are probably first generation of somewhere and they're expats or they're ex army brats or diplomat brats or we, I have found that it is uh, a melting pot of groups of friends that I have so I wouldn't say it's actually probably Indian or Tibetan but uh, maybe like from Latin America or um, from Europe and from Asia mm -hmm. they're probably the strongest groups okay um, if Kelly has any questions um, um, I guess one question I had was earlier you mentioned that although you wanted to initially do like um, journalism or something yeah and you said you moved to finance but you wanted to keep like some aspects of journalism how exactly did you like maintain that kind of hobby or sure um for for me it was going it was almost on a personal level so outside of the nine to five job Kelly, you know i did a lot of screenwriting and i still pursue that today and before it was like oh it's a voice in your head that you just write in the evenings and now I'm, as my son gets older and I have more time for myself, I I really want to see if I can pursue that hobby of, of the writing aspect. I think, and you'll probably experience this in college, if there's something that you love and you decide to do something different, that voice never goes away. It really, it'll be 10 years, 20, 30, it never goes. So in my case, I think that voice was always in the back and I did something that I was good at but uh, it's important. <coughs> it really is important. And I think why, like I'm right now taking classes at UCLA for a professional program for writing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I told my husband I also want to do it to tell my son, like, you need to do what you love. And I don't get to tell you that if I didn't do that. So, yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Is there anything you would have done differently uh, if you had a chance to sort of redo anything at all? Um, 
the easy answer is always to say no, you know, it's, it's where you are today. I would say there's small little things, but in the big scheme of it, I am very happy for the life that we have. And I think it is my personality to always try striving for perfection, but uh, it will make you insane. So twin, this year especially has been be content and um, really understand where, you know, the blessings that you have. So I would say no at this point. I'm very happy with how, how things have turned out. All right. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon here with us. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um.